The following is a PBS Election 2012 special event. Welcome to the WQLN-TV live debate for Pennsylvania's third congressional district with moderator Kim Thomas. Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for today's Pennsylvania 3rd Congressional District Debate. I'm Kim Thomas from Jet24 Action News and we're proud to be partnering with WQLN Public Television to bring you today's debate. Now in less than two weeks you will have the opportunity to head to the polls and choose the candidate you think will best represent the 3rd District. Pennsylvania's 3rd Congressional District is made up of all or parts of seven counties, Erie, Crawford, Mercer, Lawrence, Butler, Armstrong, as well as Clarion. So now let's meet the candidates. Third District incumbent Congressman Republican Mike Kelly. Mike Kelly is a business owner from Butler. Next, we have Democrat Missa Eaton from Mercer County. Missa works as an assistant professor of psychology at Penn State Shenango. And also today we have independent candidate Dr. Stephen Porter. Dr. Porter is a Wattsburg resident who spent his career working in education. Now all the questions today are my own. I have taken input from the public and gathered facts and statistics from various sources. I will be asking questions to the candidates in a rotating order today. Each candidate will then have a minute and a half to respond to each of those questions. I will then be able to use my discretion as to whether or not a follow-up question is needed. Now keep in mind the candidates may not ask each other questions. Finally, each candidate will be given two minutes to make his or her closing statement. Now, prior to the debate, we did have a coin toss to see which candidate would get the first response to the first question, and the winner of that was Missa Eaton. So let's begin, uh, Miss Eaton, with uh, a broad-based question. I'd like to know what you believe is the most pressing issue, the issue of highest priority when it comes to the 3rd District. I think the, the issue of highest priority uh, for the third district is jobs in the economy. I think that most people are concerned that they'll be able to find a job, that they'll be able to keep their job, and that the economy is going to be robust in the coming years so that they are able uh, to work and thrive. Um, you know, I've seen so many students come through my classes and uh, get degrees, and they're wonderful and they're prepared, but in order to get a job, they have to leave this area. And Northwestern Pennsylvanians don't like to leave. They're very bound here with their families. Uh, I talked with a man uh, just this last weekend from Girard when I was out uh, you know, knocking on doors. And he drives every day to Pittsburgh to work. And before that, he was driving to Cleveland to work. So I think what we have to do is we have to make sure that we bring this economy back in this region. And I'm prepared to do that. I have a five-point plan to bring back the economy for the region and jobs is at the top of that plan. And that includes supporting entrepreneurship and making sure that our businesses, particularly our small businesses, are protected and supported so that they can create the jobs, which they create two thirds of in the third district. I also wanna make sure that we have a ready workforce and that we put some investment into training uh, for the new jobs that will be coming with our coming technological revolution. All right, thank you very much. Now we go on to Mr. Kelly. Same question, the highest priority for the third district. Well, thanks, Kim. And you know, from serving in the district for almost the last two years, there's nothing that's zip code specific. And I don't care if you start down in Butler or work your way up through Grove City and Slippery Rock and Mercer, all the way up to here, up to Erie. You talk to people and it's jobs. It's the economy. It's the uncertainty of what the future holds. And as I talk to people, and again, it really doesn't matter whether Republicans, or Democrats, independents, libertarians, they're telling me there's something wrong. There's something wrong. And I'm afraid of where we're going, the trajectory of the last four years. This Obama economy has been absolutely crushing, especially when we talk about middle income people and lower income people. They're looking, and the middle income folks, $4,000 a year, their paychecks are dropping. They're looking at health care costs that were going to be kept low, and they were going to save $2,000 a year. They've actually gone up $2,300 a year. So when you look at this, you say, my goodness, my goodness, my goodness, why here? Why in the United States are we having so much problem? And the answer is, quite simply, there's been a vacuum of leadership. Now, we're all going to talk about different things that are important. One of the things is tax reform. We've talked about our energy strategy, education, certainly, global uh, economy, where we can, where we can compete. And what is puzzling to me, now, I just heard uh, my opponent say something about regulations and helping entrepreneurs. Uh, I listened to a clip earlier where she said, 
she would find ways to heavily regulate these, these companies and add more taxes. That's not what you want to do right now. You want to lower that tax burden. You want to make it easier for people to operate in the real world, create jobs, create certainty for the future, and make America's days brighter, not darker. All right, thank you, Mr. Kelly. Dr. Porter, same question, the highest priority for this district. Once again, you're going to hear the same things from me, but a little bit different solutions. The economy is the number one priority for most of the people in the area. We can create millions of jobs producing clean American energy. We have General Electric right here in Erie that produces wind turbines. Unfortunately, they sell most of them to Germany. We should be building wind farms across all of the Great Lakes, solar farms across the southern part of the United States. And we should be passing H.R. 676, which is the Physician's National Health Care Plan. That would take the burden of health care off all Americans forever. What would, do, what would that do for our economy? It would take the greatest burden off our small businesses. That is the most expensive thing that they have, is health care burdens. Mm -hmm. If we passed that health care bill, we would be able to do something for the economy. The problem is not the, are not the solutions. The problem is that the major parties are owned by special interests. It's an orgy of greed and corruption in Washington, and that's why we need independent voices to go there and enact these programs. People can say all they want to say during an election campaign, but when they get to Washington, if they're owned, they ain't going to work for us. And that's why I am running in this race, and that's what I would do for this economy. All right, thank you, Dr. Porter. We're going to move on to our second question, and this time we will begin with you, Mr. Kelly. Uh, we heard that jobs in the economy is uh, of utmost importance for these candidates. Um, let's talk about that. We heard Dr. Porter mention GE Transportation. There is concern that large companies with family-sustaining jobs uh, will continue to move out of our area, taking, for example, GE Transportation. Just a recent announcement that GE is moving 50 of really its highest paid employees from Erie to Chicago as it moves its headquarters. What will you do to improve the business climate to make sure that these types of businesses stay and thrive right here in our community? Well, you know, I, I have a continuing uh, dialogue with, with GE all the time. And I think the important thing to understand is GE is going to do some things that they look at as their future, what they have to do. But the main thing was GE Transportation is staying right here in Erie. Those 5,000 jobs are solid. You go down to Grove City and you find out they're actually improving the workload down there. There's going to be more people working in Grove City. So how have I worked with them? Well, when they come to me and say, listen, we have a global opportunity. Can you weigh in? You're on foreign affairs. Can you write some letters to us in support around the world saying, you know, there's a global economy out there? In America, as I look at it, we still build the best products. We have the highest skilled laborers in the world. But you know what? It's been gamed. The, the surface has been gamed a little bit. So what I've done is work with them to make sure that they don't have that heavy taxation burden on them. They don't have heavy regulations on them. And when they need my help, I'm able to go to bat for them. You know, there's, a, there's an initiative right out there right now to try and increase the speed of locomotives. Why don't we get up above that 125? And we say, no, 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 no. We don't have infrastructure to support it. What we want to do is work hand in hand with our, with our friends at GE. And I walk that floor. I've been there at least two times. I've been with our, our, our guys and gals that work the floor there. I understand what their concerns are. I know they want to stay here. I know they want to raise their families here. So I've done everything that we can do from a congressional seat to build coalitions in Congress with other, other members, say, listen, we've got a great opportunity. Let's make sure we keep it here in America, and let's make sure that we make it possible for GE to compete around the world. And that's what I've tried to do, and I think we've had great success doing it. If you talk to GE workers, you'd find out that's true. And quickly, uh, Mr. Kelly, just wanted to follow sure. up on that. Was there anything that could have been done to keep those, those high-paying jobs, the GE headquarters, right here in Erie? But you know what? I, that's a decision, and I, sometimes we worry. Government gets too involved with corporate decisions. So I say they pick winners and losers. I think GE corporate uh, headquarters, they've done a pretty good job. My concern was the men and women that work in those factory floors, that they stay here. 5,000 of them. And down in Grove City, hundreds of them. Those are the jobs we want to keep right here in our district. Those are people that support our communities, support our school systems, work in our churches, and in our, and all the different clubs, and do everything that are important. So you want to keep that base here. GE is going to do what they want to do with their upper management. I understand that. To be globally competitive, they needed to do something that they thought was important. But I wanted to fight for the workers. Okay, thank you, Mr. Kelly. Dr. Porter, same question. What do we do to improve the business climate in the 3rd District to keep large, strong businesses in our area? Well, there are several things that are endemic to this area uh, that uh, can't really be moved uh, and can't be outsourced. One of them, as I said before, was to uh, build uh, wind farms across the Great Lakes. You can't export that. The wind is here. 
The other thing is to engage in high-speed rail. And uh, Erie used to be a railroad center. Uh, we need connections between Buffalo, Pittsburgh, Cleveland that would uh, bring Erie in contact with those cities uh, for commerce and for commuting, for transportation. That's another thing we could do. We could also, instead of bailing out banks, we could use that money to invest in our infrastructure, in our jobs, in our factories. The reason why we spend that kind of money is because the finance industry has paid off Congress with $2.8 trillion, not my figures. You can find it on opensecrets.org. $2.8 trillion to bail out the finance industry instead of working on the problems that are hurting local businesses. Uh, all of those solutions, plus of course taking the health care burden off the businesses, would help enormously. All right, thank you, Dr. Porter. Mrs. Eaton, the same question. Uh, how do we keep strong businesses changing the climate mm -hmm. to make sure businesses stay and thrive in this community? I think when we bring uh, manufacturing back to this region, and we can't expect that it's going to be the same kind of manufacturing that we had before, but when we bring manufacturing back to this region, I think that that's going to make the difference when we have people working, when we have um, companies like GE getting enough orders to fulfill not only uh, their worker obligations at, at this plant here in Erie, but also in um, Grove City and also in Fort Worth. I've been talking to workers out of the GE plant as well, and they are very concerned that, uh, that as soon as the Fort Worth plant is built, that their jobs will move there. I want to make sure that we have enough work for GE transportation that they're going to be able to, uh, to hold uh, all three of those factories open and fully employed. Uh, I want to be an ambassador for the third district. We have the opportunity right now to get in not only on these alternative um, fuels and alternative sources of energy, but we also have an opportunity to get in on additive manufacturing. And additive manufacturing is, is the newest place that our technology is going, and it will particularly impact the way that we do healthcare. And so I'm interested in making sure that we take advantage of the leading edge of additive manufacturing and not find ourselves four years down the road on the trailing edge of that. All right, thank you, Mrs. Eaton. We're gonna move on to our next question now. Dr. Porter will begin this question. Uh, we've talked about large businesses like GE. Let's talk about the small businesses now. We have a lot of small businesses in this district. Uh, small business owners, though, expressing concern over various things, over their future. Some worry about mandated health care costs, taxes, and over-regulation. So how do we protect our small businesses and encourage growth, Dr. Porter? I think there are two things we can do for small businesses. The first is to return to the tax codes of 1960. Uh, in 1960, companies and corporations paid 24% of the federal budget. Now they only pay 8%. The difference has been put on the backs of a diminishing middle class and small businesses. Uh, we ought to restore the tax rates. The second thing, uh, as I said before, uh, is to uh, take the burden of health care off these businesses. You know, every time I mention this, People say, no, you can't do that. Uh, that's socialized medicine. Well, it's not socialized medicine. Uh, it's a single payer plan written by the physicians, and it takes the largest single piece of expenditure out of the hands of businesses, of small businesses. It would be a boon to them if we passed H.R. 676. Thank you, Dr. Porter. Mrs. Eaton, same question. Well, I think that we need to support our small businesses, and I am willing to revisit uh, the provisions of the Affordable Care Act that um, include the mandates uh, for small businesses to provide health insurance uh, for their employees. Um, I also want to do that not only for small businesses, but also for nonprofits. Nonprofits uh, had to, you know, institute and abide by the, the rule of the um, Affordable Care Act as well, but they don't pay taxes, so they were unable to take advantage of tax credits uh, that were available for that. So I want to make sure that we do that. I think the way that we can protect our small businesses is by, um, is by making sure that they have the uh, resources that they need, that they have a, uh, an educated and trained workforce at, and to bring manufacturing back to this region. If we bring manufacturing back to this region, we'll bring people back to this region. And our small businesses across the board will actually benefit from that. 
Thank you very much. Mr. Kelly, yeah, same I, question, small yeah, businesses. And, and, I, and I appreciate that. And when you talk about small businesses, you're talking to a small businessman. Uh, my dad started our business back in 1953, just uh, a little one-car showroom and about five service bays. We grew that business, we built that business, and we actually did build it. I did it with my hands. We did a lot of the lot ourselves, did the curbing, did the lot lights. But when you talk to small business people, the main thing holding them back right now is uncertainty. They don't know where the country is leading. They don't know where this administration is leading them. So you look at a tax burden, the largest, the highest tax code for in, a, in the industrialized world right now in America. You talk about regulations that are so burdensome. In fact, I've spoke out very loudly on regulations. Uh, and I didn't think much of it, but there's been over a million hits of people saying, you know what, Kelly, you said the right thing. You said a common sense approach to regulations and how it's crushing our job creators. Has his boot, the government has his boot on their throat. Now, when you can allow people to breathe, when you can allow small business people to look to the future, you say, you know what, I have access to capital. I have opportunity, education. I agree. But you know, we have to get our kids ready for the jobs that are available today. The, the science, technology, engineering, and math, absolutely incredible. The vocational. When I talk to people, I go through this district and I see now hiring signs up everywhere. The biggest problem, the people are telling me, the, the job creators saying, I can't find qualified people. So let's make sure we're keeping an eye on everything, not just the jobs for the future, but the jobs available today. There's great opportunities right now in vocational assets. We have to go after them the right way and we can do that by looking to the future with what we have on the table right now and take advantage that everything our creators put on the board for us. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Now, the next question is going to, to go on the heels of what we were just talking about. Uh, Mrs. Eaton, you're going to have the first response to this mm -hmm. question. Let's talk about a skilled workforce and education. Mm -hmm. um, what can be done to ensure that this district is provided with really the skilled labor that it needs to, to fill the workforce that is really retiring right now? There will mm -hmm. hopefully be jobs available, but how do we make sure that these people are ready for those jobs? I think that we need, to, um, we need to invest in not just higher education. We need to start investing in education from the very earliest um, levels. And when I say higher education, I'm not just talking about college. I'm also talking about trade schools and community colleges. In many ways, our, um, our four-year institutions um, have uh, bureaucracies attached to them that make it difficult for them to respond to a very rapid technological workplace. But our community colleges and our trade schools can respond so much more rapidly to the things that we need and provide those kinds of training, um, training uh, opportunities in, uh, in, you know, say two years or one and a half years instead of looking at a four-year degree. Uh, but we also need to make sure that our kids, when they come out of 12th grade, are ready. They're ready in case they're not going to college. Uh, some of them won't go to college. And uh, someone called me just the other day and they said, you know, we need ditch diggers too. And I said, well, I understand we need ditch diggers, but uh, there hasn't been a lot of uh, construction work going on to dig ditches either. So what I wanna do is make sure that we bring the opportunities back here and we make sure that we have invested in our education from kindergarten and pre-K all the way through, including trade schools, community colleges, and four-year and postgraduate institutions. And quickly before I move on to mm -hmm. Mr. Kelly, do you support a community college uh, right here in Erie County? I support a community college being available throughout the district, yes. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Kelly, same question, skilled workforce, how do we get there? And I might as well ask you as well, do you support a community college in Erie County? Well, you know what, we have a great success in Butler County with our, our community college. I know it works. Uh, I think the question is the affordability and how we do it. Everybody is entitled to an education in this country. That's the one great thing about this. Now, one of the things that I've been involved with, uh, one of my colleagues, G.T. Thompson, came up with a bill called the ASAC, All Children Are Equal. Now, we know that in our district, we lose out on $1.7 million of funding, Title I funding. Now, when you talk to Jay Badams and talk about how tough it is right now in the district to make ends meet, and when you talk to people down in Butler and in, in Mercer and Crawford, everybody's looking for the same thing, looking for some help. But the key to education, the key to education is let's make sure that when our kids come out of college, those sons and daughters that graduate with a degree and a ton of debt have a job they can go to. Right now, there's no jobs. Half of our people are graduating with no job, no place to go. It's very frustrating for them. They're looking at student debt right now that's approaching a trillion dollars, probably surpassed it right now. That's unsustainable. So the question is, how do you fix that? a robust and dynamic economy that allows people to look to the future, prepare for the future, get educated for the future, and make sure that we're taking advantage of all those opportunities. Now, we can educate people for those jobs, but we've got to do it in a broad sense, and we've got to start it very early. You know, my daughter, 
is a secondary school teacher. My wife was an elementary school teacher. And as I go around the district, and sometimes I get a chance to read to those little people, and they all say the same thing. They're all bright-eyed, and they just want to get into the, into the world and do great things. And I think we can do that, especially in this country that has so much upside for those people that are the most vulnerable, and that's the lower-income people. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Dr. Porter, what needs to be done to ensure a skilled workforce? And same thing with you. Do you support a community college in Erie County? The answer to the last part of the question is absolutely. All talent is precious, Ken. All talent is precious. And we have to find out what our children do well and give them what they need to excel in those fields without prejudice. If we do that, we will have all of the workforce that we'll need. We'll have the people who can repair cars, uh, as well as people who can uh, exercise uh, uh, brain surgery or heart surgery. Uh, we need a complete kind of education to match the talents of students with the needs of the community. The other thing is something that I'd like to go back to what uh, Mr. said earlier. We don't have to worry about having those ancillary jobs here if we can create industries which must stay here. Wind farms must stay here. High-speed rail must stay here. What, look what happened when we built railroads across the United States. We, we had cities and towns spring up all over, from east to west, and everyone was employed because a larger railroad community meant more schools, it meant more grocery stores, it meant more everything. And all of the people fed off of that industry. It couldn't be exported. It couldn't be sent to China. We need to concentrate on restoring the industries which are indigenous to this area and honoring all of the talent which can serve that community. Thank you, Dr. Porter. The next question is really kind of sticking with this same theme, and Mrs. Eaton, we'll start with you. Let's talk more about education, and we heard mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Kelly talk about, you know, the hard times that the Erie School District is having with funding. Mm -hmm. Funding is hard to come by these days for our, for our school districts. Um, how do you make sure that our children are getting the education that they need, that the schools are getting the funding they need to provide that education, and that they're graduating and that they're staying right here and not having to leave home for jobs? Well, that's kind of a, a complicated question. How do we make sure that we keep our kids here at home? I'm not sure that we should force them to stay here. If, uh, if they want to spread their wings and go somewhere else, that's fine. But I want them to have the opportunity to work here and stay here uh, if they would like to do that. And I also want to make sure that we have uh, industries that are going to bring people in from other places. I mean, I, I talk to people all the time in this district, and they're surprised when anyone moves here. We shouldn't be surprised when people want to move here. We should have things for them to move here, too. Um, I, I'm very concerned about um, our job prospects. And I think that when we bring back good manufacturing jobs, we're going to be paying, uh, we're going to have more workers at higher wages, paying more into the system that will allow us to have the funding that we need for our schools. Um, I also think it's a matter of priorities in our country. I think that we um, have lost track of our priorities. When we start to see education as an expense that can be cut and cut and cut, um, that's, that's not the way we should be looking at it. Every dollar we put into education pays back in our, our society eight and nine times. That's 800 and 900 percent. Any Wall Street investor would take that bet. So I think what we need to do is make sure that we see education spending as an investment and not as an expense. Thank you very much. Mr. Kelly, education funding. How do we ensure that the resources are there for these children? Well, you know, the three of us, there's only one of us that's been a lifelong resident of this district. I've watched this district when it boomed. I used to come up here for vacations in the summer. My roommate from Notre Dame is a guy named Mike McCoy. It was hard here back then to get on the beach because there's so many people here. Uh, we go down to Prescott, but the, you go to 12th Street, there was factories everywhere that were doing well. Now, what's happened? Now, listen, I don't think anybody has left this area because they want to move away. They left because maybe the opportunity wasn't there for them. How do we protect that? Well, again, if you repair the economy, if it becomes dynamic and robust, and all the rest of the, the conversation we're having today is just going to be conversation because if you don't get this economy back on its feet, if we don't have jobs, people won't, they don't leave here because they don't like the area, they leave here because there's no work. And a lot of our lower income and our middle income people are really suffering under this. And I said earlier, $4,000 a year, their paychecks have gone down, their health care has risen. If we can't make this the most wonderful place to live, and we can do it, education is the key to it. Getting ready for the jobs that are ready today 
taking advantage of opportunities that we have. America is still the biggest marketplace in the world. We can grow it on the outside. We can go after the entire global economy, but we have to make sure that we're doing the right things that we can do that. So when you look at GE, when you look at Lord, when you look at all these wonderful opportunities for education, uh, getting people ready for jobs, look to that, look to keeping it intact. When I talked to Barry Grossman early on, uh, when I first came in office, he said, you know, Mike, let's do something together. Let's do something to protect the jobs that are here and keep those jobs here. Let's make sure that people that want to stay here can stay here, and then let's bring other people in. So I think the answer is education, but looking at the jobs that are available. All right. Thank you very much. Um, our next question we are going to talk about. I was going to skip you, wasn't I? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> Please explain uh, your thoughts on education funding to ensure that, you know, these, these kids are getting the proper education. Thank you, Ms. Thomas. <laughs> We haven't talked about the inequality of property taxes. I wrote a book in the, at the end of the 1980s about this problem. I visited every country with whom we are geopolitically competitive. We are the only nation that makes the mistake of funding education through property taxes. It's regressive. It hurts areas with poor property values. It keeps racism. Uh, a, a factor in education for decade after decade after decade. We have got to stop doing that. We need to fund education through a set per capita student rate run by the state and equally applied to all areas. This idea that it's going to be your property tax or a business that's going to pay for what is mandated for a student in all 50 states is nonsense. We can't do that. There's no other nation in the world that does it. We should stop it now. And if we did, we would have the money for our schools without all of the other economic rigmarole that my two opponents have been talking about. OK. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Porter. Um, our next question, we're going to focus on poverty. It's, it's a major issue uh, in our community, specifically the city of Erie. I know a lot of the things that we've talked about um, tie into this, but really approximately 17 percent of Erie County residents are living below the poverty level. That number gets even higher once we get into the city. We're looking at 25 um, percent, which both of those rates are above both Pennsylvania and the nation's average. So what can you do as a congressional leader to make sure that these numbers are turned around? Well, again, poverty is a result of being held down, not having the education to rise out of that. It comes down to America's always been about equal opportunity, but not equal outcome. So when we start talking about how we're going to allow everybody to rise, how we can let all boats rise, then you've got to look at what the problem is. If the problem truly is that we don't have the ability to create those jobs right now, I look and say, why don't we? Why don't we? We're awash in natural resources. We have coal, oil, gas. We have potable soil and tillable water. Uh, our Tom Tillable Soil and Potable Water. We have things that are absolutely incredible. Now, one of the things I voted for was the community health care centers because I thought it was very important that some of these folks in the poverty areas had access to health. So I voted for that. I'm one of only four Republicans to do that. And I did that because talking back here with our friends in the district, I understood that how difficult it was. The other problem is, I talked earlier about Title I funding. When you lose out in $1.7 million in revenue that should have been here, You've got to go and you've got to fight for that. Now, how do we do that? We work together. We form relationships. I have colleagues that I can work with that are in similar situations, understand what we're going through in this district. You know, the problem isn't just right here in Erie. While we see rising poverty levels, it's all throughout our district. We want to make sure that we look to the future and say, you know what? Let's get ready for the jobs that are out there right now. We can do it. They're there. We just had a vacuum of leadership. So poverty is, is a condition of an economy that's not growing. And my goodness, the last four years, we've seen one year after the other after the other that we're not growing. We need to get the economy back on its feet, increase the opportunities for people. And when those tides rise, it lifts all boats. We can do that, folks. All right. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Dr. Porter, uh, same question. What do we do to turn these poverty numbers around in our community? What can you do as a congressman? $14 trillion has been spent by special interests to pay for the corruption of both major parties and the entirety of Congress. We have spent hundreds of billions of dollars bailing out banks. That money could have been applied to creating jobs for people. We did it during the Depression, the CCC camps, the Tennessee Valley Authority, things like that that built the future of America 
that built new industries, that employed unemployed people. Why can't we do it now? Because the people in Congress don't want to spend the money on the public. That's not their job anymore. Their job is to aggrandize the fat cats who have paid them off. They have traded service to the people for an orgy of greed and special interest power. We have got to change the way we do that kind of business in Washington. The money is there. Fourteen trillion dollars in special interest giveaways to campaign funds for Republicans and Democrats. And Mr. Kelly is telling me that we don't have 1.7 million dollars for this economy. We have thousands of times more than that to help poor people in this economy. We don't have the will in Congress because Congress doesn't have the will. They are not going to serve the people before they serve the people who pay them off. The money is there. Thank you, Dr. Porter. Mrs. Eaton, same question about poverty. Poverty, um, poverty is difficult to address uh, in bad economic times like we have now. But poverty hasn't been addressed when we had good economic times either. Every time our country has been churning out jobs for people, et cetera, there have still been people who have been poor. There have still been people at the low end of the poverty, in that, in that poverty range. And I think we have to do what we can to lift them up, to say, you need a little scaffolding now. Let's show you a different life. And when, when you have generations who have known nothing but poverty. They don't understand that there's anything else but the way that they live. And we need to make sure that they have jobs as well. We need to make sure that their children have early childhood education. We need to make sure that they have the best schools possible for their children. I think this is just an imperative. Um, and it's not just in the city. I know it's a, it's a terrible problem in the city because you just have higher concentrations of people. But I did research in the rural areas of Northwest Pennsylvania, uh, and I can tell you that more than 50% of the children in the rural areas of Northwest Pennsylvania qualify for free and reduced price lunch. That is poverty, and it's in the cities, and it's in the country, and we need to address it where it is. Thank you very much. Our next question will begin with Dr. Porter. We're gonna talk about uh, health care a bit more. I know we touched on it when we talked about poverty, but um, keeping with some statistics, 14% of adults in Erie County reported back in 2007 that they don't even have health insurance. Death rates are increasing for cancer, kidney disease, and Alzheimer's in our community. So what is your plan, Dr. Porter, for making sure that everyone has affordable health care in this third district? I've said it before. H.R. 676 was introduced in Congress in 2009. It was relegated to committee, and people who are owned by the insurance and the pharmaceutical lobbies have refused to let it out to be debated on the floor and to be voted on. It is the physician's national health program. It doesn't belong to the insurance companies. It doesn't belong to the pharmaceutical lobbies. It belongs to the doctors who serve us, and they were the ones who put it together. The bill is there. All it has to do has to be done is pass it, debate it and pass it. Everyone in the United States will have comprehensive health care, everything you can think of except cosmetic surgery, everything, for 5.5 percent of interest uh, of, of uh, income. Why? Because the insurance companies don't participate in the program. There are no copays. You don't have to buy off the insurance companies to pass Obamacare. You don't have to buy off the pharmaceutical companies to pass Obamacare. And by the way, Obamacare doubles the life of patents, and that's going to cost us, uh, cost the people of the United States, hundreds of billions of dollars more for important drugs. The bill is there. What we don't have are people who are unowned to pass it. It passed because Congress is owned by those lobbies with trillions of dollars of campaign funds. Thank you, Dr. Porter. Mrs. Eaton, uh, same question, health care. How do we make sure everyone has affordable health care? Well, I would, uh, I would just like, uh, uh, Dr. Porter has said this a couple of times that we're, we're owned by uh, major corporations, et cetera. I'm not owned by anyone but the people of the third district. That's who I owe my allegiance to when I go to Washington. Uh, I wanted to tell you a really quick story. I have a friend named Age, and uh, Age is expecting her first child, and she's very excited. She has no health care, 
And then about four weeks ago, she found out that she has stage three breast cancer. Now our friends are holding bake sales and they're selling candy bars and they're selling wrist bracelets. And they're even having a volleyball tournament to raise funds to pay for her cancer treatment. And this is not a unique story. Most of us have heard this before. You've been to a spaghetti dinner uh, for someone who even had health insurance, but they got cut off because they hit a limit. The Affordable Care Act does a first good first step to getting people uh, in a physician's office for primary care. More people are covered now. Unfortunately, not my friend age. Um, it it uh, does away with the pre-existing conditions over a phase out. Uh, it closes the donut hole for our seniors. And it's not a perfect law, but we need to get down and roll up our sleeves and go over it and over it and make it better. And that's what I want to do. But you are for the Affordable Care Act. I am generally for the Affordable Care Act. Okay, thank you very yes. much. Mr. Kelly, same question on health care. Um, how do we make sure, we, we understand you have voted to repeal the Affordable Care Act, so how do you propose that we make sure everyone has affordable health care in this district? Well, I, I think first of all, when you talk about the Affordable Care Act, it was supposed to be Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. It was supposed to be accessible and affordable, and my goodness, uh, it doesn't reach, reach a lot of those goals. Now, there are some things in the Affordable Care Act I like. Uh, however, we know that accessibility is not one of them, affordability is not one of them. When you create a panel of 15 unelected bureaucrats, they're going to make decisions about your future and what your health care is going to be. Now, I'm 64 years old. I don't want somebody making decisions about my health care. I sit down with my wife and my kids, and I'll make those decisions with my doctor. I don't want 15 people who don't know me, don't know what my hopes and my dreams are, don't know what I want to do as we go forward. Now, the idea was to let's get everybody at the table on this, okay? Let's not pass it in the middle of the night without debating it, without amending it, and it truly was shoved down the throats of the American people. We know there's a kickback from the American people on it. If it's going to be affordable, we got to look at tort reform. If it's going to be accessible, we got to look about how we're going to handle our doctors and our nurses and our providers. The president has said, who gets hurt the most in this? Providers. Now, the last time I looked, those providers are who we go to for health care. So, we can have all these different discussions. One of the panels that I sit on, our, our foundation I sit on, is called Hope on Wheels. This is between Hyundai dealers and Hyundai Motor America. We have, in the last 10 years, raised over $57 million to fight pediatric cancer, to make sure that no parent, no grandparent ever has to hear that your child has cancer. We have the Kansas Foundation right here in Erie. My goodness, the technology is out there, but we have to go after things that fix it and not just bounce around it from the outside, making it a political agenda, affordable care, and accessible care, absolutely. So, but if the Affordable Care Act is repealed, what do you propose we do to make sure that the Americans do have the health care? Well, the need? framework is what has to be concentrated on, Kim. And we know that in this case, as Speaker Pelosi said at the time, we have to pass it first to find out what's in it. My goodness, is there anybody out there paying attention? So if everybody wasn't at the table, if you're not at the table, just saying out now, you're on the menu. Who was left out? Patients were left out, providers were left out. We didn't do what was best for the American people. We did what was best for a certain group. We wanted to hurry up and get it through. They passed it at midnight on Christmas Eve. And anybody looking at that and think that was the American way of doing things, I think that came a far cry short of what the founders intended for us. All right, thank you, Mr. Kelly. Our next question is pretty much going to stick with the health care situation. We'll b begin with you, Mrs. Eaton, talking about women's issues, um, a hot topic right now um, that has to do with the Affordable Care Act, um, contraception. Um, there are people going back and forth, the law requiring that health insurance plans provide contraceptive drugs, and there's an argument which even our Erie Catholic Diocese has joined in that says it affects religious liberties of employers and individuals who are opposed to such drugs. Where do you stand on the idea of providing contraception for women, keeping in mind uh, in the city of Erie there are double the state rate of teenage mothers, uh, as well as your stance on abortion, so contraception and abortion. Well, I'll tackle abortion first. Um, I think any time there is an abortion, it is a failure. It's a failure of our system. But I think history has shown us that when we have abortion as something illegal, it doesn't stop abortion from happening. I think it's important that we make it safe and legal and that we work diligently to make it rare. And I don't see how restricting access to, um, to birth control and contraception is going to make abortion any rarer. In fact, since uh, the, uh, the Affordable Care Act provided uh, that contraception without a copay, then what has happened is the abortion demand rate has gone down. 
So that is a very short study that has just been done, but I think it's very telling. And so I think that that's very important. I think we trust women to raise our children. We trust them to be the moral centers of our home. We trust them in every capacity in the workplace. And yet, we don't trust them to make their own health care decisions. Now, I expect that uh, Congressman Kelly is going to talk about religious liberty here. And I want to make sure that people understand, insurance is compensation. And my employer cannot tell me what to do with my compensation. And that is, it's a, it's a question of whose religious liberty does he want to talk about? Is the employer's religious liberty above mine as an employee? I don't think so. No one is forcing anyone to take contraception who doesn't want to take it. Thank you. Mr. Kelly, same idea on contraception. Read the question again because I'm, Absolutely. I think sometimes there's a confusion over a contradiction of okay. the First Amendment and contraception. Okay. I was asking uh, with the law requiring that health insurance plans offer contraceptive drugs, but there's also an argument, uh, like I said, which the Erie Catholic Diocese has joined in, uh, that it affects the religious liberties of employers and individuals morally opposed to such drugs. Um, I threw in the, the idea that in the city of Erie, the percentage of teen mothers is double the state rate. So I'm looking for your thoughts on providing contraception and your thoughts on abortion. Well, I, I don't think that when you look at this, the, the issue is about keeping people from having uh, the ability to get to contraceptive things. Now, I'm unabashedly pro-life, especially innocent life. I will never, ever stop defending that. But also, in this book, and I'll provide it for the other, other folks here, our First Amendment very clearly very clearly stipulates that Congress shall never, ever establish a law respecting establishment of religion or the free exercise thereof, They're bridging the right of freedom of speech or of the press or for all of us to get together and petition our government for grievances. Now, when you start telling people this is what you're going to have to do, even though it goes against what I believe in my heart as a Roman Catholic, I've talked to Bishop Zubik in Pittsburgh, I've talked to Bishop Troutman up, up here in Erie, I've also talked to Coley Colazar down in, in Meadville or the uh, Hermitage area. There's a reason people don't like the fact that the government is telling me, I don't care what you believe, I don't care what your religion says, you're going to provide this type of service. Now, I'm not saying women can't have the right to these contraceptive means. They can do what they want. There's laws that protect them through this thing. That's not the issue. The issue is, can a government tell you, as a private citizen, that regardless of what your religion says, regardless of what your conscience says, you are going to provide this under an insurance policy that you pay for it? My goodness, have we lost sight of this book? And have we lost sight of our amendments? Remember, the founders, the very first amendment to our Constitution, and the very first words are about religious freedom and our ability to the free exercise of that. If we don't understand that, then we certainly have fallen far, far from what the founders intended. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Dr. Porter, your thoughts on contraception? I need to go back to a couple of things that were said before. First, uh, to Ms. Eaton, they don't give $14 trillion uh, to Congress <laughs> because they like their looks. They give it to them because they want to buy them off. The second thing, Mr. Kelly, listen to your own words. You want to work out the solutions to health care with your doctors. So why not pass 676? It was written by your doctors, not by the pharmaceutical lobby. Now, as to this question of abortion, I am going to go back again to Mr. Kelly. There are other amendments that uh, are in the Bill of Rights. The Ninth Amendment, and look it up for in that little book if you'd like to, Mr. Kelly, it says the enumeration of certain rights in the Constitution shall not be construed to deny or disparage others which are retained by the people. How do you know that a woman's right to choose her own reproductive behavior is not one of those other rights? That it is a woman's choice Whoever, whosever choice it is, it's not John Boehner's, and it's not uh, uh, Nancy Pelosi's, and it's not the courts, and it's not anyone else but my wife, myself, and my doctor. That's it. And that is guaranteed constitutionally by the Ninth Amendment. Read it, sir. Thank you, Dr. Porter. Um, I'm going to get off the topic of health care for a moment. We are, believe it or not, running out of time. I want to talk about energy um, and with that, all the natural resources that we have in this district, um, but also staying safe when it comes to the Marcellus Shale and Utica Shale and as well as where fracking is concerned. So I guess your thoughts on energy, uh, providing energy in this district and Well, when you look at this district and you look at Pennsylvania in particular, we have been called the Saudi Arabia of natural gas. And I know about the Marcellus opportunity. I know about below that is Utica and below that is Rutherford. And we have at least two centuries worth of natural gas of what we know today 
We have two centuries of coal. I was just in a coal mine yesterday, 800 feet below the surface, talking to coal miners, looking at what clean coal technology really is, and understanding 200 years, a couple centuries worth of coal in the Pittsburgh vein. I'm not talking the whole country. I'm talking about opportunities, jobs, affordable jobs. This is a country that is awash in afford affordable, abundant, and accessible energy. We have coal, oil, and gas. We have tillable soil and potable water. We can control our own future. These are jobs. We're talking about millions of jobs. We're talking about keeping our energy costs low. When you keep your energy costs low, listen, when you're a middle income person, lower income person, the cost of energy affects everything you put on your back or on your, in your mouth. The things you do for your children it affects everything. Why in the world would we be looking now about renewables when we know that right now almost 80% of the energy we have gets about 10% of the subsidies? Conversely, about 12% of what we do through renewables gets about 80% of our, of our subsidies. So if we're going to look to the future, look to what the Lord's been put here. I want to look at the market. The market ready fossil fuels that we have right now makes sense. A bridge to the future, yes. But when you're talking two and 300 years of supply right here with what we know, and geolo geolo geologically we know that there's more there, we just haven't core sampled yet, America's future is bright, but we have had no energy strategy to go forward. This picks up the tab on our infrastructure, our, 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 our grid, our power grid, all those things can be taken care of by going after energy that the Lord has given us. It's right here and it's available right now. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Dr. Porter, your thoughts on energy and... Well, the way of the future are non-fossil fuels. That's clear to everybody who has studied ecology and the global uh, warming problem. However, however, as a bridge to that future, if it can be demonstrated that fossil fuels can be used in a clean way, that it will not harm the people or the environment, I would be in favor of it if every dollar that were spent there were matched by building non-fossil fuel energy, wind energy, solar energy, biofuels, uh, nuclear fusion, if we could solve that problem. That is really God's way of uh, heating the universe, Mr. Kelly. That's how every star works. That's what we ought to be looking at. Our eye ought to be, ought to be on that sparrow. But I realize that we have today to take care of. Let's take care of today but with the right ecological research and with independent people, independent people, not people from the energy industries, but independent people determining the safety of things like fracking or clean coal or whatever. If it's not demonstrated to be safe, you can't do it. If it's demonstrated to be safe, put a sunset on it and match it with uh, non-fossil fuel energy development. Thank you, Dr. Porter, and finally, Mrs. Eaton. Um, I think that the people of Western Pennsylvania are very fortunate to sit on top of all of this gas, uh, both gaseous and liquefied, and I would love to see us extract that, uh, but I am very concerned about the process of extraction. Uh, I, I want to make sure that we uh, keep the air we breathe and the water we drink uh, clean, and, and the only way we're going to do that is if we make sure that we do this extraction in the right way. And so I have not uh, been satisfied that this is a completely safe process. And I'm not, uh, you know, the gas industry has seven special exceptions to, uh, to different laws that every other industry has to abide by. And if uh, what they're doing is safe, then I think they won't be upset if we take away their special exception to the Clean Water Act or if we take away their special exception to the Clean Air Act. Because if it's safe, they shouldn't have anything to worry about. So I think that we need to be very cautious with that. I also want to see us do wind off the coast of Erie. We have the opportunity to produce the, the uh, electricity that Erie uses right here and not in the southwest part of our state. Um, we have an aging nuclear uh, arsenal, not arsenal, a nuclear uh, uh, capabilities, and the only way that we're going to do that is to rebuild them because they're getting old. We have to take maybe half of the $41 billion that we give the uh, oil and gas industry every year, profitable businesses, and pull that back and put that into renewable energies. All right, thank you very much, Mrs. Eaton. Well, we are nearing the end of our program, so we want to go, go ahead and get to our closing statements. Each candidate will get two minutes for a closing statement. We did have a uh, dice roll, sure. coin toss, if you will, prior to the debate, which set the order, so we will hear from Mr. Kelly first. Well, first of all, Kim, thank you for allowing us to be here today, and WQLN, I, I, I think this is great. Uh, listen, two years ago, 
the people from this district sent me to Washington to try to reduce the size of the government and rein in our spending. And this is the first time in the country's history that this Congress has been able to do that. Now, there's a lot of work to be done yet. And I think as we look to the future, we say, okay, you got a good start, but how are we going to fix it? Now, the last four years under the Obama economy have been staggering and have been a crush on our middle-income people and our lower-income people. I know that. When you sent me, you sent me to get things done. My whole life has been built on being able to sit down with people and come to an agreement, uh, come up with things that make sense for both sides. And it doesn't really matter if you're Republican or Democrat, by the way. If you're a true American, you want to see this country rise. Now, we know that the last four years have not been what they're supposed to be. The president said uh, in four years ago, if I don't have the unemployment down to 5.4%, you shouldn't reelect me. If I don't cut this deficit in half, you shouldn't reelect me. Uh, and those are promises I, I think you should keep. The other thing he did, there's one, one promise he did keep. He told people, look, if you want to produce electricity using coal-fired power plants, you can do that, but we'll bankrupt you. Now, he has kept that promise. We're bankrupting coal generation, uh, power generation. And I've been out there. I've been in the mines. I've been to the Marcellus sites. I've been not only with the people who go after the energy, I go after, I've been with the people who protect the environment. I understand that. But when you look at the opportunity for this country right now, my goodness, there's no reason for us to be where we are. It just doesn't make sense, and it's not right. Now, I've worked very hard the last two years to represent you well on the floor of Congress. I don't spend my time in Congress. As soon as I'm out of session, I come back here. I come back because I want to be with you in your churches, in your schools, in your factories, and in your homes. And I've done a very good job of doing it. At least I think I have. And your staff, by the way, 15 people who work for 705,687 of our constituents doing what's best for you every day in building relationships and coalitions with not just Republicans, with Democrats, to get to American solutions to America's problems. And I thank you for allowing me to serve, and I hope you give me the opportunity to go back and represent you the way you'd like to be represented. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Dr. Porter, you have two minutes. Well, if this is so great, I'd like to know why the other two candidates uh, dropped out of the three debates that they had pledged to do uh, in addition to this one. The trouble, ladies and gentlemen, is not the issues. The issues are solvable and probably more easy, easily solvable than you've been led to believe. We can reduce the federal deficit by going back to the tax rates of 1960. We can take the burdens of health care off our shoulders by passing H.R. 676. We can create millions of jobs uh, by using the bank bailout money to do it. We can leave Afghanistan now and save hundreds of billions and thousands of lives. We can restore the solvency of Social Security by lifting the earnings cap. We can restore the integrity of our government by funding campaigns with tax dollars instead of bribery schemes. The problems are not the issues. The problem is the fact that both major parties have taken that $14 trillion, Mr. Eaton, and have sold their service to the people for service to the powerful. It's an orgy of greed and corruption in Washington. That's why I am running. I want to be sent to Congress as a counterbalance to that. Send me there. Let me speak for you for two years. If you don't like what I'm saying, boot me out. Send me home. Try someone new. But for God's sakes, let's stop jumping between the frying pan of one corrupt agent and the fire of another corrupt agent. You have the power in your hands, my fellow Americans, to change the way we do that kind of business. I pray to God that you use that power in the voting booth to restore the integrity of the democracy I know we both love. Thank you very much for listening to me, and thank you, Kim, and to people here for having me. Thank you, Dr. Porter. Mrs. Eaton, you have two minutes. Thank you. I would like to be your next congressional representative because I feel that I have a unique empathy with where you are. I have worked hard all of my life. I worked in retail. I owned my own business from time to time. I worked for other people as well. I have worked in real estate. I even ran a stock car racetrack for two years. I have been where the people of the third district are because one day I walked into work and my boss told me he didn't have any more money he was closing the business and he couldn't pay me for the last two weeks. So I had to go out and find another job and that wasn't easy. And I had a young child at the time. I've been a single mother putting myself through college. I have done the things that I needed to do to make things better for my family. 
For the last 17 years, I've worked in higher education, and I've taught students right here for the last eight years, right here in Northwest Pennsylvania, where, um, where they were just like me, from blue collar families, et cetera. And I know what you are feeling. I understand that uncertainty. I understand that it's hard to know where your next meal is gonna come from. But we can be better, and we can do better, and I wanna do better for you. I have a plan that I formulated from talking to people, and it involves job creation and economic development. It involves protecting our seniors and our veterans when they return home. It involves investing in education, making sure that when we're sick we can go to a doctor, and making sure that right here in Northwest Pennsylvania, we, the Pennsylvanians, take advantage of the great riches to come from our uh, from our energy sources and that includes a well-rounded energy policy. I want to make sure that we do everything possible uh, but not everything for people. So I ask for your vote on November 6th and I want you to know I make you one promise every day that I am your congressional representative I will be working for you the people of the third district not for myself not for a special interest for you. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Eaton. Thank you to all of the candidates today. That concludes our debate for Pennsylvania's third congressional district. Remember, this is a representative seat. So on November 6, go to the polls, decide which candidate you think will best suit your interests, what will best represent you as a member of the third congressional district. Thank you for joining us.